live NFL trivia every Wednesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge for a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. The man you're looking at right now is Don Shula. He's one of the greatest coaches in the history of the sport, and as of this video, is the all-time leader in NFL history with 328 wins. He was a head coach for 33 years, and finished 172 games above 500. For some perspective on how long he coached, when he first started out, there were 14 teams in the NFL. By the time he retired, there were 30, with the league more than doubling in size. In other words, Shula, who has coached over 500 games including the postseason, has seen just about everything. You're not going to be able to fool Don Shula or do something that he really didn't see coming. Which is what makes what happened in 1985 all the more remarkable. Because in a 1985 game against the Miami Dolphins, New England Patriots head coach Raymond Berry completely fooled Don Shula. In a play that players after the game would describe as one of the gutsiest things ever, and in a play that Shula would later call great. And not only did this play help win the Patriots the game, but it saved their season and set them up on a path where they would eventually make it to their first Super Bowl in franchise history. And this is the story behind the gutsiest play call in Patriots history. Before I talk about the call in question, we need some context to understand how both teams were looking heading into the game, as well as how the game was going up until that point. The 1985 season was the first that Raymond Berry was the full-time head coach of the Patriots, after he took over for the final eight games of the 1984 season. And unfortunately for him, it seemed like the 1985 season was getting off to a really poor start. The team was 2-3 and three through 5 weeks, and had the third worst offense of the AFC. For a team that had made it to the postseason once in the last 6 years, and that one time was the strike shortened season in 1982, when more than half the league made it, this was not the ideal start. However, the Patriots were able to turn things around after rattling off 3 straight wins, defeating the Buffalo Bills, New York Jets, and Tampa Bay Buccaneers in succession. The good news for the Pats was that at the halfway point, they were 5-3, thanks in part to a defense that was the third best in the conference and was picking up the slack from an improving yet still not great offense. The bad news was that the AFC was ultra competitive, and the Pats had little room for error over the second half of the season. And if you don't believe me, ask the Denver Broncos, who finished that season with an 11-5 record and still wound up missing the postseason. Up next for the Patriots in their quest to keep their winning streak going and make it back to the postseason was the Miami Dolphins, who much like New England, were sitting at 5-3. The Dolphins were the defending AFC champion who had represented the conference in two of the previous three Super Bowls, and boasted an offense that was top five in the NFL at the time, and had arguably the best quarterback in all of football in Dan Marino, who one year prior in 1984 was putting up numbers that no one had ever seen before at the quarterback position. Miami swept the season series in 1984, with both wins being by double digits, and had momentum on their side, having won five of their last seven, and having put up 30 or more points in four games during that stretch. The winner of this game would get a massive boost to their playoff chances, while the loser, even though it was definitely doable, would have somewhat of an uphill climb with 7 games to go. We know the situation, we know what's at hand and what's on the line for both teams. Now, on November 3rd, 1985, it's time to play some football. After the Patriots failed across midfield on their first drive of the game, it was Miami's turn to drive down the field and show why they were one of the best offenses in football. It only took a few Dan Marino throws to get the Dolphins deep into Patriot territory, and from there, Ron Davenport was able to punch it in from 3 yards out to give the Dolphins an early 7-0 lead. Side note, Davenport might be one of the greatest one-year wonders of all time, as the rookie scored 11 rushing touchdowns that season, finishing 3rd in the league, and then scored 2 rushing touchdowns for the rest of his career. Anyways, the Pats seemed like they were stringing together a good drive, but it comes to a halt after an uncharacteristic drop by arguably the greatest receiver in the history of the franchise, when Stanley Morgan can't quite haul this one in. Once again, mistakes doom the Patriots when on their next drive, Steve Grogan hits former first overall pick Irving Fryer for the touchdown, but it gets called back due to illegal motion. The drive then ends with Grogan throwing an interception, and the Dolphins capitalize off of the good field position by getting 3 points and taking a 10-0 lead. On one hand, the Pats are playing an incredibly sloppy game. They've turned it over a few times, they made some critical and somewhat uncharacteristic mistakes, they're playing undisciplined football as they would finish the game getting penalized 11 times compared to the Dolphins who only got penalized once, and they just don't look good or comfortable when they have the ball. On the other hand, at the half, they're only down 10-3. They're still right in this game. Their job doesn't get a lot easier late in the third quarter after Rod McSwain gets called for a very blatant pass interference penalty, which leads to Dolphins kicker Fouad Revez hitting a 32-yard field goal on the final play of the quarter. However, entering the fourth, despite New England's really poor play, they're only down by 10. Time's running out, but by no means is this impossible, 
so long as the Patriots start the final period off on a strong note. And that's exactly what the Pats do. On the first play of the drive, New England keeps it simple, as Grogan throws a screen pass to former Pro Bowl running back Tony Collins to give the team a first down. That's followed up by a simple check down to Craig James, who does his best to atone for a fumble he had earlier in the game by bouncing off of multiple Dolphin defenders, and somehow powering his way forward for a first down. After only two plays, the Patriots were past midfield and into Dolphin territory. Eventually, the Pats face a third down situation, and Grogan hits Stefan starring for six yards. While it's not enough for the first down, it brings a fourth and one, giving head coach Raymond Berry some options. The Patriots take a timeout to think things over. And what they come up with next is absolutely stunning. Before I show the play, Let's consider the options that New England had that they could have gone with here down by 10 points facing 4th and 1 on the 28-yard line. Option 1 is to try the field goal and cut into a one-possession game that way. I think a lot of coaches would have opted for the field goal in this situation. However, on this day, that was a pretty high-risk play. The weather wasn't great, as it was a wet day with winds of 17 miles per hour. While the wind didn't impact Tony Franklin on his 38-yard attempt in the first half, Franklin isn't the most reliable kicker from 45 yards out. Over the previous five seasons, Franklin made 21 out of 42 attempts from the 40 to 49 yard range, meaning that he only made his field goals 50% of the time. Down by 10, essentially relying on a coin flip just to have a chance at cutting into a one possession game is not great. Option two is to run the ball. On paper, this seems like the smart thing to do, since you only need a few feet to keep the drive alive. Miami's run defense is not very good. They finished the 1985 season ranking 23rd in the league out of 28 teams in rushing yards allowed and 24th in yards per carry allowed. The Patriots were having success on the ground all day, as they finished the game with 203 yards and over 5 yards per carry. New England had two quality options to give the ball to. One of them was Craig James, who had finished the 1985 season with over 1,200 yards rushing and a Pro Bowl appearance, and the other one was Tony Collins, who was only a few years removed from a Pro Bowl and a 1,000 yard season of his own. Both men averaged well over 4 yards per carry on this day. However, the problem with this is that Miami is completely expecting the run. Look at how they're lined up. They have 11 men in the box. They're crashing the line. Simply put, New England does not have the blockers necessary to match up well with Miami here. Which leads us to option 3, which is to throw the ball. On paper, even though this is the last thing Miami is expecting, this sounds like a horrible idea. Steve Grogan was playing terribly. He had thrown 3 interceptions. He finished the game completing less than 50% of his passes and posting a passer rating of 36.2, which is worse than if he did nothing but spike the ball to the ground on every single play. And you've got to get this ball off quickly, because Miami is bringing the house. You don't have time to do something that's going to have to develop deep down the field. All you need is a yard, and you have little to no time to get it. With all of that in mind, guess what Raymond Berry called in this situation? If you guess the flea flicker, congratulations because that's exactly what happens next. Grogan takes the snap under center and hands it to Collins. After getting the ball, Collins tosses it back to Grogan. I want to pause it right here. At the time Grogan gets the ball back, there is only one dolphin in the frame, and he's sitting on the ground, with Collins right in front of him to block him should he get up. It was at this exact moment that Miami realized they were completely screwed. Grogan, with seemingly all the time in the world, fires it to Greg Hawthorne down the middle of the field for the 28-yard touchdown to give the Patriots a 13-10 lead. Fun fact, this was the last touchdown that Hawthorne ever scored in the NFL, and what a way to go out. I don't think a single soul saw the flea flicker coming. It was an incredibly gutsy call that you never see coaches call when they only need a couple of feet, and it's a play where everything has to go right for it to work. And somehow, it did. The Patriots were back in the game, and if the defense got a stop on the ensuing drive, New England took its first lead of the game when Grogan, who did it with his arm earlier in the quarter, did it with his legs and ran it in from a yard out to give New England a 17-13 lead. That would be the final score, as the Patriots walked away from this one victorious. And after the game, all the talk was about the absolutely insane decision to call a flea flicker on fourth and inches. Steve Grogan, who usually called all his own plays, flat out disagreed with the call, saying he wanted no part of the decision. He said, I was shocked, but Coach Berry said, it'll work. It was one of the gutsiest calls I've ever seen. He then added, I'm not sure I would have had the courage to call that. And the talk about the play didn't just end with Grogan. Patriots running back Mossy Tatupu joined in, saying that it was Halloween a couple of days ago, so the Pats decided to surprise them with a trick play. Barry said on the play, called the 135 Flea Flicker, that that's the way it should be, all or nothing. And man, was that the case here. Even Don Shula had nothing but praise for Barry after the game for that seemingly insane play call 
saying it was a risky call, but when it works, it's a great call. Barry and Shula knew each other well, as when Shula was coaching the Baltimore Colts, Barry was there and was establishing himself as one of the greatest receivers in the history of the sport. The teacher had nothing but praise for his student. So that raises the final question. In the grand scheme of things, how important was that flea flicker? It might have saved the Patriots' season. Let's start with the team on the losing end of things with the Miami Dolphins. As it turns out, this meant absolutely nothing. The Dolphins didn't lose another game for the rest of the season, and ended the year with a 12-4 record, rattling off seven straight wins to take their third straight AFC East Division title. Not only that, but when Miami played in the postseason, they never had to leave their home stadium. After the Los Angeles Raiders lost in the divisional round, the entire AFC and the path to Super Bowl XX ran through Miami. This loss and this demoralizing play did not derail Miami's season in the slightest bit. But for the Patriots, yeah, this flea flicker might have been one of the most underrated yet important regular season plays in franchise history. The flea flicker gave New England tons of momentum, as they won their next two games after that, and finished the season with a record of 11-5. Without the flea flicker, they likely don't win that game, and that means that they miss out on the postseason, as 10-6 would not have been good enough. Instead, they win the game, make it to the postseason, and as a wild card, make it all the way to Super Bowl XX, their first Super Bowl in franchise history, after defeating none other than Don Shula's Miami Dolphins in the AFC Championship. Calling a flea flicker takes a ton of guts. There's so many things that have to go right, and if any element goes wrong, like a lineman getting too far down the field, or the defense reading it and none of the already limited receiving options being open, it can lead to disaster. But calling a flea flicker on fourth and a foot? That is one of the craziest calls I've ever seen. But the old saying of it's only stupid if it doesn't work truly applies here. If this play backfired, the Patriots would have lost the game and Barry would have been crucified in the newspapers. Instead, this gutsy call saved New England's season, served as the catalyst to the team making its first Super Bowl ever, and is remembered nearly four decades later as the gutsiest play call in Patriots history. Get your official Jaguar Gator 9 merchandise by going to jj9shop.com and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, subscribe down below if you haven't already as it helps the channel out a lot, and be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9pm Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes, link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed out to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at jrgator9 and subscribe to 60 Second NFL History on YouTube. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JJ9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters who help the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.